Lebanon is on high alert this Monday night with Israel launching a ground invasion. The next stage in the war against Hezbollah will begin soon. The warning to Iran and the West amplifying calls for calm. Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. There's many calls that have not been answered yet. The pressure piling on governments over broken promises and lack of progress. Making reconciliation fashionable. Isn't it it's beautiful? The goal of an Indigenous artist and a Canadian clothing company. Plus, a long road to rebuild after Helene, the mammoth cleanup from a monster storm. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Nitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news in the Middle East. The Israel Defense Forces confirms it has begun limited ground raids against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Explosions are being seen and heard tonight in Lebanon along Israel's border. The IDF has declared closed military zones in three northern communities and it says troops are targeting Hezbollah infrastructure in Lebanon's southern villages. Airstrikes hit Beirut today, the first Israeli attack in the center of the Lebanese capital since 2006. And the IDF has issued evacuation orders for several areas in Beirut's southern suburbs. Fears of an expanding war heightened further today with this warning from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Iran and its residents. There is nowhere in the Middle East Israel cannot reach. There is nowhere we will not go to protect our people and protect our country. With every passing moment, the regime is bringing you, the noble Persian people, closer to the abyss. Redmond Shannon is following developments for us tonight. Israel conducted more airstrikes on Lebanon Monday, including this bombing which killed Palestinian militants in Beirut. Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant met with troops near the Lebanon border. The next stage of the war against Hezbollah will begin soon, Gallant said, to complete the goal of returning residents to their homes in Israel's north. Israel later declaring a part of the northern border region a closed military zone. They have, at this time, told us that those are limited operations focused on Hezbollah infrastructure near the border. U.S. President Joe Biden was asked if he was aware of Israel's plans. I'm more aware than you might know, and I'm comfortable with them stopping. Canada's foreign minister spoke at the U.N. Monday, joining calls for de-escalation. There cannot be war in Lebanon. Full stop. Hezbollah's deputy leader says his fighters are ready for an Israeli ground invasion. Naim Qasim now stands as the militant group's most senior figure, making his first address since the killing of Hassan Nasrallah. Houthis in Yemen are also vowing to respond against Israel after it launched a wave of deadly airstrikes on the country Sunday. All part of assaults on proxies of Iran across the Middle East. Iran is promising to avenge the attacks, fueling greater concern war in the region will continue to escalate. Iran is, from the outset of this conflict, has been very hesitant to be drawn into direct confrontation with Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu suggesting Monday he's prepared to go further, all the way to regime change in Tehran. When Iran is finally free, and that moment will come a lot sooner than people think, everything will be different. Tonight, Israeli strikes are once more being reported in Beirut's southern suburbs. And down on the Lebanese border with Israel, Reuters is reporting that troops from Lebanon's armed forces have retreated back. Nitu? All right, Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks for that, Redmond. Turning now to news from here at home, today is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Across the country, people acknowledge the painful legacy of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. It's also a day to recall the history of residential schools and the trauma of government policies which continue to inflict harm on society today. Reflective of that reality, the fact just a fraction of the 94 official recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have actually been completed. Here's David Aiken. A day for ceremony and reflection. 
Today, we commemorate the thousands of lives forever lost or traumatically impacted by the residential school system. But for many Indigenous groups and leaders, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation is also a day to press governments to fulfill their promises. There's many calls that have not been answered yet from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've come a long way and we have a long way to go. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission set 76 calls to action that involve the federal government on everything from residential school research to child welfare to renewing treaty relationships. Campaigning in 2015, the Trudeau Liberals promised to complete all 76. But as of the beginning of this year, just 11 were complete and 39 were in progress. That's according to an Indigenous watchdog group. In 2015, the Trudeau Liberals vowed to eliminate all long-term drinking water advisories on First Nations reserves. 145 advisories have been lifted, but 40 are still in place. And now, residential school survivors say the Trudeau government is breaking a promise to fund Indigenous-led efforts to document and identify those children sent to residential schools who died or never returned. We're trying to uncover a history that's 150 years old, and the limited funding we've been provided in three years, it's not doable. The Prime Minister was in the Northwest Territories Monday, signing a child welfare agreement with Indigenous authorities, and he conceded more must be done. This is uh, yet another step forward on what is a very, very long journey. There is so much more still to do, but every step of the way, uh, we are moving forward. Governments might even find that moving forward on reconciliation is, well, good politics. New polling from Ipsos, provided exclusively to Global News, shows that 75% of Canadians believe more ought to be done to confront the legacy of residential schools. Nithu. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks for that, David. There is support for survivors. A 24-hour crisis line is available for anyone experiencing pain or distress as a result of their residential school experience. You can call toll-free and speak in confidence at 1-866-925-4419. A little later, we'll have part two of my conversation with the family and friends of a residential school survivor in BC. Why they're demanding answers for his recent and sudden death, even after police ruled out foul play. Dock workers launched a three-day strike at the Port of Montreal this morning, bringing Canada's second largest port to a grinding halt. About 350 employees walked off the job, shutting down two terminals. The job action affects more than 40% of the port's container traffic. It was called to pressure the employer to address scheduling and wages. Each day of the strike puts nearly $91 million of economic activity at risk. Britain has become the first G7 country to stop burning coal, the dirtiest of all fossil fuels. The country that sparked the Industrial Revolution announced a two-year decommissioning process of its last coal-fired power plant. The UK is ramping up renewable energy instead, with a plan to move away from fossil fuels by 2030. In the U.S., multiple southeastern states are reeling from the death and destruction inflicted by Hurricane Helene. So far, more than 100 people are dead in Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, the Carolinas and Virginia. And that number could grow as families and first responders search for those who are still unaccounted for. It's estimated the damage could reach up to $100 billion. Jackson Prosco reports on the devastating storm's grim aftermath. The damage is historic and difficult to comprehend. That's my neighbor's house. It's gone. In the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee, entire communities are gone, washed away after Hurricane Helene dropped extraordinary amounts of rain. It's flooded before. It's gotten up to our like bank and everything, and it's never been that bad. Dozens of people are dead, including a seven-year-old boy swept away along with his grandparents as they took refuge on a roof. Only the boy's mother survived. <laughs> Officials expect the number of fatalities to grow substantially. Hundreds of people are still unaccounted for, or at the very least, unreachable. It's not just a catastrophic storm, it's a historic history-making storm. The entire southeast and Appalachia. Damage from the hurricane stretches across at least 10 states. 
In the city of Asheville, there is no power and no cell phone service. Oh, thank you. Residents are lining up for drinking water. They expect this to be a long-term disaster. Sounds like it's going to be a couple weeks before water. Fuel is increasingly in short supply. The lines at gas stations stretch for kilometers. The wait lasts hours. We're not going to have power for about two weeks for some people. In Florida, where Helene made landfall as a catastrophic Category 4 hurricane, entire neighborhoods were wiped off the map. It survived its blown glass. Residents are picking up what little is left, wondering if it's worth the effort to rebuild. So many of these island people worked so hard and they've just lost everything. Help is arriving as a massive humanitarian effort takes shape. After all that's been lost, recovery seems unthinkable. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. It's being called unsafe and unprofessional. Coming up, who was flying too close to a U.S. military plane? The still smoldering ruins of residential blocks could be seen in the eastern Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. On Sunday, Russia hit the city, home to a nuclear power station with at least 13 guided bombs. Those bombs wounding at least 16 people, including two children, while damaging homes and nearby infrastructure. Russia also trying to hit Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, with several drones, but those were intercepted. Ukraine, for its part, is also developing more sophisticated drones, which it's using to fly deeper into Russian territory. Dramatic new video showing a Russian Su-35 fighter jet flying dangerously close to an American military plane. The footage was released by the U.S. and Canada's North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. It was captured last week off the coast of Alaska, while planes were intercepting Russian aircraft flying near U.S. airspace, where they're expected to identify themselves. In a statement, NORAD's commander called the Russian jet's conduct unsafe, unprofessional, and not what you'd see in a professional air force. In Nepal, the death toll is climbing from intense rains that triggered deadly floods and landslides over the weekend. More than 200 people are confirmed dead across the Himalayan country, most of them in its capital, Kathmandu. Dozens are also missing, but improving weather conditions are helping search and rescue efforts. Much of the disaster is being blamed on Nepal's poor infrastructure mixed with the worsening effects of climate change. The world's highest mountain is having a growth spurt. Researchers say Mount Everest is being pushed upwards because of tectonic movements. It's getting an additional boost as a result of erosion by surrounding rivers. The process has resulted in Everest rising an extra 15 to 50 meters over the last 89,000 years. There is breaking news from the world of sports. Longtime Major League Baseball player and coach Pete Rose has died. Rose left baseball as the sport's all-time leader in hits with 4,256, a record that still stands. But his career also ended in disgrace. Baseball permanently banned him for betting on games as a player and manager, denying him entry into its Hall of Fame. Rose was a 17-time All-Star and three-time World Series champion with his hometown Cincinnati Reds. He also played briefly in Canada for the Montreal Expos. Rose repeatedly sought reinstatement over the years, but was unsuccessful. He was 83 years old. Ahead, the Canadian business collaboration involving an Indigenous artist and a good cause. My people, my fellow Indigenous people still missing or murdered to date. We need to search those landfills. Hundreds gathered in Toronto for the Every Child Matters Healing Walk, honoring Indigenous lives affected by oppressive policies and demanding action from governments. The march, organized by Sisters in Solidarity Toronto, acknowledged victims of colonial violence. Coinciding with the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, participants called for meaningful change to address ongoing injustices. 
A retro Canadian clothing company is making a new mark. Mondetta is teaming up with an Ojibwe artist to launch a new clothing line in honor of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. The company took the world by storm in the late 80s with its line of t-shirts and sweatshirts featuring world flags. The fashion house has evolved over the years, but its roots are the same, offering high quality active wear which celebrates diversity and culture. As Melissa Ridgen reports, the focus this year is reconciliation. I visualize pretty much everything I hear, and to me, I'm always thinking that would make a great painting. Winnipeg Ojibwe artist Jackie Travers sees great stories as great art, while Manitoba clothing mogul Ash Moda, co-founder of Mondata Clothing, believes great art makes great clothes. So this is all made with organic cotton. We did this one in the uh, orange color uh, for, for Indigenous Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Mondetta Performance Gear by Jackie Travers launched today for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. The four medicines bomber jacket, so it's got the four different medicines on, on the product and, and on the beautiful one on the back. Yeah, isn't it? It's beautiful. I like stories of people overcoming obstacles, difficult times in their lives and reaching their goals and just people turning their lives around into something beautiful. That's really inspiring to me. To Moda as well. I find it inspiring that as Manitobans and we're far more into reconciliation and doing the right thing than most of other parts of Canada. And I think that's what is, is kind of neat. Proceeds from the line go to Traverse's charity of choice, a crisis shelter for Indigenous women in Winnipeg. Doing the right thing is the right thing to do. And if you do it, 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 it'll come back to you in some other way. It doesn't have to come back to you in a monetary way, but it'll, it'll actually come back to you in another way of making society better. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Keeping with the Made in Manitoba theme, the Winnipeg Embroidery Company that helped put Mondata on the map with those world flag designs. Now we go full circle 38 years later, and all of these embroideries are done by his sons at All Canadian Emblem. So what a, what a great story, and, that, and that's what makes Manitoba really neat. It's just that constant circle. Moda and Travers hope their partnership inspires others to team up to make something good too. On this shared reconciliation journey, Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Winnipeg. Next, a BC community honours a residential school survivor. In Calgary, family, friends and supporters of John Wells spent today marching in his honour after the Indigenous man died in police custody. The 42-year-old from Blood Tribe was involved in a police incident at a hotel lobby two weeks ago. Body cameras captured officers beating, tasing and restraining Wells moments before he died. Alberta's police watchdog is investigating the incident, just one of nine across Canada since August, involving Indigenous people dying during police altercations. A community in Kamloops, B.C. is also grappling with the sudden death of Douglas Eustache, a residential school survivor. His loved ones say his story underscores the ongoing struggles of their people. I recently traveled to Kamloops, B.C., where the family said their rallies for justice are a movement for recognition and change in a system that too often neglects Indigenous voices. Hi. This family is drumming for their relative Douglas Hyacinth Eustache, a residential school survivor who was well loved in Kamloops, BC. He was just a very giving and caring person. It was always about somebody else, not so much about himself. Even after my mom and him separated, he let me call him dad, so he was a big part of my life growing up. He died in hospital in June after being found unconscious in this home with blunt force injuries. Police and forensics experts say there was no evidence of foul play. At uh, about 4.30 in the morning, we heard a big commotion next door. We spoke with this neighbour who said he was not interviewed by RCMP and questions their claims of having done a thorough investigation. And he was pretty beat up. He had a big black eye and a gash on his head and his shoulder was all screwed up. Well, there was foul play, <laughs> for sure. Basically just saying that he, that Doug had fell down the stairs. There was no closure at all. And yeah, I just don't feel that the family's voices have, were heard. He deserves better. He deserves 
a voice. Indigenous studies scholar Winona Hall says it's important to contextualize Eustache's life and struggles in the larger narrative of injustices faced by Indigenous people in Canada. For his situation to be deemed non-criminal, non when we knew he attended residential school, and we know residential school was a crime, so putting that within the larger narrative, I think, is, in, is important. In a statement, Kamloops RCMP told Global News, every sudden death, regardless of the identity of the deceased, is investigated with equal urgency and thoroughness. That is an outright lie. There's more than enough evidence out there that shows that cases involving Indigenous peoples are not treated the same. They need to do a complete paradigm shift in how they're treating and dealing with our cases. As the community honours Eustache's memory, they reflect on the importance of cultural identity and collective healing. It's not only for him, it's for our First Nations people. Be able to um, work together and heal together. On this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, we leave you with more images of how Canadians acknowledge the painful history and legacy of the institutions of assimilation known as residential schools and the children who attended them. It's a day to reflect and move toward healing and honoring the truth. Thanks so much for watching. I spent 11 years in that residential school. I still see it today. I still hear the screams. Kids were chained against their bunk beds. We must join together and heal. To get along better, to have that better understanding for uh, what has happened to those young kids that were, uh, you know, murdered. It's more than just wearing an orange shirt. It's doing the work within the systems that are still have inherent racism. I hope people like honor who we are and 